Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon and welcome to CSIS Live. Thank you so much for joining us. We are privileged to sit down this afternoon with Dr. Enrique Sala, who is an explorer in residence at the National Geographic and is the founder of the Pristine Seas Project. And this is a project, if you're not familiar with it, is remarkable, has led to the conservation of over 22 uh, unique uh, largest marine reserves on the world, totaling about 5.8 million square kilometers, larger than the size of the European Union. And he's here this afternoon to share with us his latest book, which is The Nature of Nature. And this is nothing short of a call to action to literally save the world. Uh, Dr. Sala's book uh, has been heralded by E.O. Wilson, by Jane Goodall, by the Prince of Wales, uh, by uh, an incredible list of thinkers. And I think if you picked up a copy, you would see why immediately. Dr. Sala has an unbelievable ability uh, to bring some of the most complex uh, leading edge scientific knowledge about biodiversity and conservation on the planet and make it incredibly relevant for anyone who would read it. And coming at this from the perspective of international security and, and risk management, uh, it, it was uh, amazing how timely this is. There's even a very direct connection in the epilogue with COVID. Uh, so Dr. Sala, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're neighbors in the physical world whenever we get back to that uh, and in 17th uh, Street in, in Northwest Washington, DC, but I'm glad we could get together virtually. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a, a few questions about the book, and then we have a live question uh, capability on our website. If you go to CSIS.org and you have your own questions, we'll turn to those at the end. But tell me, Dr. Sala, at the, at the outset, one of the key themes I think that, that really surprised me maybe in, in the book is that the more we learn about how nature works and how biodiversity works, uh, the more fragile we understand everything is. So far from gaining mastery over our environment by understanding it better, we understand in a sense how, how, uh, how interlinked we are with it and how it is beyond our control and therefore uh, we need to, to preserve it. Could you tell us just a, a little bit about how you arrived at the conclusion that you did based on the, the science you looked at and what the implications are for us as a species? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, John and CSIS for, for having me today. Yeah, the book, you know, the theme of the book is basically that everything is connected. And we know that it sounds trivial, but uh, we have no idea about how interdependent we are with every other species on the planet. It's not just connection among humans. It's connection with 9 million species of plants and animals and at least a trillion different types of microbes. No, we cannot recreate what nature does for us, right? Everything we need to do, everything we need to survive is produced by the work of other species. Now, the oxygen that we breathe comes from not only the forest and the plants on the land, but also from microbes, microscopic algae and bacteria in the ocean. The wa clean water we drink, hopefully, it has been filtered by a healthy forest, not by, by a water treatment plant. The food we eat is all plants and animals. So we do need that life support system. And we have been ignoring our life support system. We have not valued it pr properly. And we take this thing for granted. But we cannot recreate what nature does for us. We cannot produce all this oxygen. We cannot make food out of nothing. Although some of the processed food that we can find in the supermarket, <laughs> you know, is a good example of that. Uh, so we, we cannot even build the smallest ecosystem to maintain a small group of humans alive. You know, think of the International Space Station. It takes billions of dollars every year and a huge deal of international cooperation to keep four humans alive. But the International Space Station doesn't produce anything, right? It's, uh, we, we need to ship everything there. So 
um, that's what I wanted to do with the book, to share my learnings for the last 30 years of research, where I have looked at how species interact and self-assemble, creating these wonderful ecosystems that we call forests, wet, wetlands, grasslands, coral reefs that, that provide for us, and why we need to keep that machine as it is. If ain't, if ain't broken, don't fix it. And why economically it would be much more beneficial to protect a third of the planet than continue with the business as usual. You, you have some fascinating studies in the book about keystone species and what happens when you remove uh, in particular predators uh, and, and other keystone species. And, and you look at the, how the, the timeline for this can be hundreds of years sometimes, the effects of whaling on uh, the otter populations affecting uh, sea urchins and kelp and just the disturbance that can be created by removing one, one species. Um, at the same time, you, you talk about humans as a hyper keystone species. Could, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, I think people have trouble, I, they separate themselves from the natural world. We're, we're humans, we shape the world to our, to our benefit, we, we have mastery over it. I think this is a mentality that, that pervades in a lot, of, a lot of places. We'll fix it if we break it. But first of all, what, what, what have we already broken here on the keystone species level and, and what do we learn from that? And, and what do you mean when, we, when, when you and others refer to humans as a hyper keystone species? Yeah, keystones are species that are on like an architectural arch. The keystone is the that stone on top, right? If you remove it, the whole arch collapses. Keystones are the glue of the ecosystems. These are the species that keep ecosystems together, that keep the world together. An example of removing a keystone species is what happened to us in the eastern United States after the wolf was exterminated from this part of the country. And the wolves are on top of this food web and the wolves uh, eat or scare coyotes, which eat foxes, which eat rodents, but also the, the wolves also eat deer. So what happened in the Eastern United States, we removed, exterminated the wolf, converted the habitat from forest to mostly agriculture. And then you have this secondary forest, which is a great habitat for a deer. Now there is this explosion of deer, right? White tailed deer. So, because the predator is not there. And the deer is the ultimate host for the ticks that give us humans Lyme disease. And that problem is exacerbated because the host of the baby ticks is those little rodents, those little mouse that are much more abundant now because most of the foxes are gone because the coyotes are abundant because the wolves are gone. So by removing one species, we have created all these uh, effects in cascade that propagate throughout ecosystems that end up uh, affecting us. So that's one example. And I think that COVID, the COVID pandemic is the best example we have in recent history of how our tampering with nature is creating a global crisis because everybody's talking about the response to the pandemic. And of course, we need to make sure that we take care of those in need right now and, and bring in by the economy. But the ultimate cause of this pandemic is a virus spilling over from wild animals to humans, creating an outbreak. And thanks to our globalized lifestyle, that spread like wildfire across the world, creating this global pandemic. And today is COVID-19, but yesterday was SARS and Ebola and HIV and many other uh, epidemics and pandemics. So it is our tampering with nature that is creating these global effects that affect not only nature, but also people. And as we have seen, uh, the global economy. So really, we're talking about uh, when we look at when we look at nature, we're talking about huge cascading risks as we affect biodiversity in different parts of the globe. You, you had mentioned before we uh, went live here, um, something interesting too about even thinking about the the effects of of climate change on precipitation and a part of the world affecting potentially conflict elsewhere. Could you give us that I example again about you know I, I think we really are at a at a turning point here as we've realized in living in an age of epidemics the 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 compression in time of sort of epidemics and pandemics, what we used to call every hundred year, once a century really isn't anymore. And we see that on, on other scales and climate change and other things. But on the conflict side, there's always been sort of 
a debate in the international security community to say, can you really prove that environmental damage led to a conflict? And increasingly, the answer seems to be to be yes. And you're giving us a warning here. Absolutely. There's an example in the book. Uh, think about the, the forest, the largest intact forest in Africa, the Congo Basin Forest, which is in Gabon, Cameroon, the, uh, Congo, and the uh, DRC. That forest is so rich because it receives so much rain. But the funny thing here is that the forest produces its own rain. In the tropical uh, heat, the trees absorb water from the ground, and thanks to the heat, takes it to the leaves, which evaporate, transpire like, like sweat, like humans. And that water vapor, when it rises and condenses, then falls as rain, which in turn creates a low pressure system that draws moist air from the Atlantic Ocean, which ends up in more rain and so on and so forth. That rain is the rain that waters the highlands of Ethiopia. Without a critical mass in that Congo Basin forest, no more rain in the highlands of Ethiopia, which means half of the Nile is born there. And also it means no more food for Ethiopia. And we all know what happened um, 30 years ago when uh, during that last great fam famine in, in Ethiopia. We're talking about 100 million people, uh, double it by 2050, according to the latest projections. And we all have read the news about the big hydropower dam in, in, the, in Ethiopia that um, Sudan and Egypt are, are so worried about, right? Even Egypt um, threatening with uh, uh, some military intervention. So it is the Congo forest that is providing the water that keeps those countries going. If the forest in the Amazon, if we lost 20% of the current forest, there wouldn't be enough trees to produce that rain. So the forest would turn into a savanna, which means completely destroying the weather patterns in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, in, the, in the Congo basin, we don't know the numbers, but it's probably very similar. So the best thing we can do to uh, prevent you know, one of the potentially major sources of conflict in, in Northern Africa and in, in Eastern Africa is to keep that Congo basin forest intact. That's why conservation of nature is the smartest and also cheapest investment we can have right now for public health, for a global economic system, and also for global resilience. Let me ask a minute just to, about the current political climate that we're in. Uh, in the COVID response, obviously, the immediate public health crisis, the economic fallout is really taking up government's time and energy and, and attention. And that's especially a shame this year because 2020 was going to be the year of the Convention on Biological Diversity, the first that we'd had, I, I think, in about 20 years of serious note. Uh, it was going to be a, a major UN climate change conference. And you know, if you if you looked at what was going on in the conversation at the beginning of the year, it was very focused on on environment. Now we're very focused on on both COVID and then a range of social and political issues. We're in a transition year in the in the U.S. Um, what do you think it's going to? How do we how do we get policymakers to 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 pay attention to this again? I think I think your book is a great is a great case uh, that's that's made. But um, you have a lot of experience doing this with pristine's uh, with pristine seas. Could you tell us a little bit about you know some of the tools that you've used and, and you think we could use here to make sure that if we get to a stimulus phase after the recovery, we put some money aside for conservation. We we change some of the things that we're doing. Absolutely. And yeah, there's this. Uh, so the World Economic Forum this uh, January came up with a global risk report, right? The top five risks globally were associated with the loss of biodiversity, the loss of nature, and climate change. Right? But now leaders believe that it's the um, health issues and the recovery of the economy and employment that are the most important issues. But it's all related. Because again, the, so the ultimate source of this pandemic is our broken relationship with nature. It's illegal wildlife trade and the destruction of intact habitats, natural ecosystems where these species that carry these viruses live. That you know, the more we encroach upon these intact ecosystems, the, the less we protect, the, the easier it is for these viruses to come 
on our doorstep. So for pristine seas, the, the best formula has been first to reach to the heart of the decision makers and then to the brain. So in the case of pristine seas, we take leaders, country leaders to the, these wonderful places that are still quite intact. And invariably, they fall in love with these places. Everybody falls in love with a wild natural place. And then when they realize that these places are unique and irreplaceable and that they have to do something about it, then we come with the scientific studies and the economic analysis to justify that uh, intuition, that emotional decision to do something about these places. In this case, I think that leaders around the world have already felt that emotional uh, connection to people because people are dying, people are getting sick, uh, there is a lot of human drama, right? So I think that that emotional connection is already there. Now, the important thing is to stress the economic argument here. And the question is not, can we afford to protect more of nature? The question has to be, can we afford not to? Because the IMF estimates that the cost of the pandemic is going to be probably $9 trillion in the next couple of years. Well, we released an economic study this year uh, suggesting that protecting a third of the planet would cost on average $140 billion. That would preserve these intact areas where those species live. And that would reduce the risk of these viruses to come in contact with, with people. The cost would be only a fraction of the benefits. For every dollar that we invest in nature, nature gives us on average $5 in return. In the United States is more. For every dollar that the government invests in our national parks, that generates $10 in economic output that go to, to uh, private pockets. The, the returns are extraordinary. And when you look at the growth of the nature conservation uh, areas, like uh, tourism, for example, before COVID, it was growing on average uh, five to 6% every year while agriculture and, and forestry was growing less than 1%, and fisheries are a shrinking sector. They are declining, right? So investing in more protection of nature would produce this, uh, it's like an insurance premium, but also would produce benefits that I would weigh the cost by five to one. And also $140 billion is less than what we spend today, not me, but the world spends today in video games. So it, it just, it, the, the, the numbers are very, very clear, right? What we need is that uh, political leadership right now, not to prop up the industries of the past that will perpetuate the problem, but actually invest in the, in the businesses of the future that are going to help us build a, a socioeconomic system that is more resilient because we have been building for unfettered growth based on hyper leverage. And this pandemic has shown it very clearly that our economic system is not resilient. So we better take a you know, hard lesson from, from this crisis. And you, you make a, a case in the book as, as others have increasingly, I think over the past few years in looking at issues like economic inequality, but of the use of gross domestic product uh, as a, a very inaccurate measure of economic growth because you're, you're, looking, you're not looking at what you're spending down that you can't recapitalize. And a lot of that has to do with environmental destruction. You, you make that point. Um, so, you know, we don't price in what we lose uh, because we're not counting its benefit in an accurate way in the economy. Um, we're, not, we're not counting how offshore uh, ma or, or how mangroves have, have saved us hurricane damage. We're only counting the hurricane damage and it, it shows up that way increasingly. Um, have you, have you, do you have views on, on, you know, if, do we just need a fundamental rethink of what we use in place of GDP? Do we tweak how we measure GDP? Uh, that's, that's a little bit where the argument's going on, on climate change, of course, with carbon, um, and European Union taking, taking actions on carbon, but we're just talking about carbon. We're not talking about total environmental damage or, or the um, you know, accruing benefits of conservation. You could see very high GDPs from countries that don't necessarily produce a lot just by maintaining things. What, what, do, what can we do there? What kind of creative tools and levers might there be? You know, you are absolutely right, Sam. GDP doesn't measure what's really important to people, which is uh, health, 
well-being, happiness. You know, Bhutan has the gross happiness index. And, you know, this is not something that uh, we just made up. There are Nobel Prize in, in economics that have been talking about that for, for a long time. Joe Stiglitz, one of them. President Sarkozy of France already came up with a, a plan to substitute GDP with something that is more meaningful. You know, it's so ridiculous that if we cut a forest, um, the GDP will go up because we are able to sell the timber and that will count as, as, as productivity, right? But then we'll have, because of the extreme weather events, we'll have torrential rains. The forest will not be there to retain the rainwater and protect us from floods. So there, there will be these floods that are going to destroy the villages uh, downstream. But then construction business will be uh, there to reconstruct. So that will also contribute to GDP. It doesn't make any sense. If we keep the forest intact, we are avoiding all those costs and providing many more benefits to people, including well-being. But that does, is not accounted for in GDP. So clearly, uh, we need to another another system that has to do with um, how mature is our relationship with nature. You know, because it is the avoided costs that are so important to consider here in the accounting that people are not putting in the balance sheets. That's a, that's a great point. And the, the other challenge that we're facing now in, in increasingly in the COVID environment, um, and we, we alluded to it with the cancellation of these big multilateral conferences on biodiversity and climate, but our president and CEO, John Hamry, says the, the problems are horizontal and the institutions are vertical. Uh, and of course, uh, Joe Nye um, has, has memorably talked about um, geopolitical distancing in the midst of, of COVID. Countries are getting further apart from each other, further from working together. Um, where do you think the energy is going to come from to address these big multilateral issues? Or have you found in, in pristine seas and elsewhere, is it, is it really bilateral? Do you work with countries one-on-one? -on -one? That seems to be the, the favorite of the current U.S. administration. But to solve these problems, do we need to get back to, to multilateralism? Is, are, are the U.N. and others up for the challenges we face? Well, that last part of the question, you probably are better uh, informed than me to, <laughs> to, to answer. But you know, I'll give you an example. We just finished some research looking at uh, ocean priorities. What are the areas that we should protect in the ocean? To achieve multiple benefits because people many people believe that we have to choose between growth or a conservation right but we have broken that wall we have shown that if you protect more areas of the ocean these areas are going to come back like compound interest on an investment account and many of the fish that are inside these areas are going to spill over the boundaries of these reserves helping to replenish the fisheries around so our analysis shows that if we protect at least 30% of the, of the ocean in the right places, the global fishing catch is going to increase. That means that not only that benefits of protection extend beyond those boundaries, but also there are carbon co-benefits because it, like the forest of the land or the mangroves on the coastal area, if we prevent the disturbance of the carbon at the, on the seafloor, by bottom trolling or deep sea mining, we're going to be avoiding a large amount of carbon emissions. So we're going to help to mitigate climate change. So we look at this map of global priorities and we ask the question, how can we protect, how much should we protect to achieve uh, multiple benefits for food security, for climate change mitigation and, and conservation of nature? What are the areas that would protect the key areas for biodiversity? And, we did two scenarios. One is every country is me first, right? We are, I'm going to look only at the priorities within my nation versus we look at the global priorities because life, biodiversity produces global benefits, right? The, the, the global commons. And what we saw was that the amount of land and ocean that is required to obtain the same benefits doubles if we look at the issue from a national perspective. So it would require only half of the percentage of the ocean that we need to produce all these benefits if we look at the global priorities on a multilateral approach rather than if we look at every country first. So that's another example that shows that um, we cannot pretend to solve uh, our problems within our boundaries just by looking at ourselves. And again, the COVID pandemic is a great example, right? You cannot put a wall 
to, uh, or, you know, in your borders to protect you from, from a virus. You cannot uh, put walls in the ocean to protect you from overexploitation of fish stocks all around. You cannot um, pr uh, pretend that by building a dam, you're going to uh, solve the water availability, the water security issues in your country, because those will depend on a forest that is 2,000 miles away. Right? So um, definitely the pandemic is the loudest wake up call, I think, in our recent times uh, that prove that there is no other way. We cannot uh, continue with, uh, with this um, nationalistic um, unilateral or bilateral approach. We, we need more than ever to break these silos and bring the climate convention, the biodiversity convention, the World Health Organization, and working together on an integrated plan because um, that's the that's the way that's the way the work is right now. The the book really is a, a urgent call to action because you give some really clear case studies of what happens in the natural world when species disturb the ecosystem, uh, which humans are doing at a scale we've never achieved before in all kinds of ways that, that we notice. In spite of all that, though, I, I walked away from reading the book feeling hopeful because you gave some great examples of um, cases where where conservation was put into place and the returns were were so obvious. You had to overcome the political obstacles, but but once you got there, it was undeniable. And I've I've had the opportunity to visit some some marine preserves in Indonesia and done some of the best scuba diving of my life and seen indigenous communities there that were just. Um, living at a level beyond where they were elsewhere because of tourism, because of the fisheries being protected. And uh, no one was a better advocate of conservation than the people who lived in those in those communities. So that that's what gave me hope from from reading the book was thinking about that. But then the challenge of scale is is vast. Um, you know, countries like China, you make the point that that maybe at an individual level, meat consumption isn't so problematic, but you multiply that times 1.4 billion and it is an unsustainable scale on, on oceans and, and fisheries resources, for instance. What, what gives you hope, though? What, what, what uh, as you wrote this book, uh, did, you know, I always get this, uh, when I give my presentation about trends, people say, boy, I wish you'd build some more hopeful stuff in there. I, th I think you did a good job of balancing the two, but what, what stands out to you to give you hope? Yeah, you know, we cannot uh, dwell on the doom and gloom, that's for sure. There are two things that give me hope. One is the ability of nature to bounce back. Now, I have been to places in the ocean that were degraded. And after protection from fishing and other damaging activities, marine life comes back spectacularly. Places where the largest fish was about this big now have large groupers and jacks and snappers and sharks. So the, the nature, especially the ocean, has this extraordinary resilience. And the other one is the example that has been uh, given by some countries. Now, next year, we have the COP15 of the UN Convention on Biodiversity. This is going to be a historic convention, similar to the Paris climate meeting in 2015. This is the time and the place in Kunming, China, where the world is going to agree on how much more space we are willing to give to nature. And we are National Geographic Society with the WIS Campaign for Nature and and other partners, we are working with a series of countries. There are already 30 countries that are targeting 30% of the planet, land and sea, protected by 2030. So we want to get this global agreement, this global mandate. But there are countries that have already protected 30% or more of their land and waters. And in the, on, in the ocean, Palau has protected 80% of their waters. Niue in the South Pacific, 40%. Seychelles. 30%, Chile, uh, 42%, and, 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 and a few more. So it is these leading countries. Most of them are ocean nations with a lot of fishing, but they realize that there is no future to their, explore, to their use of uh, nature on land and at sea unless we set aside some principle, some uh, investment accounts that, uh, that we can, that can produce returns that, that we can enjoy. So that's what gives me hope. Uh, this, this example of, of living countries and the ability of nature to bounce back. Great. And let me open it to, uh, to audience questions. Uh, Christine uh, Brazo has helped us put together this whole event is, is uh, helping uh, steer those our, our way. I know we got, um, a couple uh, in uh, yesterday as as well, um, and.
if, if people haven't gotten their questions in now, uh, now is the, the time. So please, uh, please let us know what those are. But um, let me ask uh, this, this question. Um, oops, where did it go here? Um, The, the, the question is, is this, how can we, and this is from Linda Yar at George Washington University, can you even speak of the wild uh, when every part of the globe has been affected by the actions of humankind? Is there, is there such a thing as the wild left out there? There are places that are still pretty wild. You know, you, you go to some islands in the middle of the Pacific, you jump in the water, and, as, and I have done that, you jump in the water and as soon as your bubbles clear, you are surrounded by a dozen great reef sharks. After a while, they get bored and they go back to their business. Then you look down and you see so many fish, you cannot even see the coral. Now, there are places in the middle of the Amazonian forest or in Gabon where there are populations of lowland gorillas and chimpanzees that are not uh, used to humans and untouched uh, forests. And so there are places that even though everything is affected by climate change in one way or another, there are places that are much wilder than others, right? So I don't worry too much about the, the semantics of wild pristine. There are definitely still wild places in our in our world that they are absolutely uh, worth and, and necessary to, to preserve. In, something we haven't talked about that comes out in the book is, is there's really a, a spiritual element to this. And, and I, I noticed uh, Cardinal Turkson is one of the, the people who have lent uh, praise to the book. You, you thank uh, Pope Francis, too. Um, you, you make reference to a lot of uh, indigenous communities, religious traditions that, that apply to, to nature. Could you talk a, a little bit about the, the spiritual case and, and dimension for conservation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, despite the utility that we get from, from nature, which is our, you know, our life support system, all these creatures have not been put here just to be our slaves, to serve us, to produce oxygen and food and clean water and protect us from floods, just because we are so cool. Uh, you know, and religious uh, communities are very clear about this. Indigenous groups that manage their lands traditionally and prevent the destruction of their lands and their cultures from industrial sources are another great example. And, and protection of, of nature absolutely needs to include and power indigenous groups and their cultures because you know, traditional knowledge is one of the most powerful ways to keep that life support system for them and, and for everybody on the planet. So yeah, you can be a religious person and believe that we shouldn't destroy God's creation. You might be a scientist just absolutely in love with nature, with this sense of awe and wonder by the complexity, this miracle of this ecological engineering that we cannot recreate. You know, it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum. You know, all those species have an intrinsic right to exist. We have no moral authority to decide who goes and who stays. And But even if we are very selfish, even if we just look at uh, for ourselves, we should not tamper with it because we don't know what all these species do, but some of them might be absolutely essential. In, uh, one, one example is a very small bacteria, uh, Prochlorococcus, which is a very, very small nanobacteria that produces most of the oxygen, the species that produces more oxygen on the planet. We didn't know about the existence of that bacteria until 30 years ago. So we cannot take anything for granted. We cannot dismiss any of those species, no matter how small they are. They all are essential to our well-being, to our existence on this planet. But also, there is something bigger than just our our, our growth. You know, there is something really beautiful and spiritual about this miracle that we have here on this planet that we cannot find anywhere in the in the in the near universe. So we better respect this this marvel of creation or whatever your creation myth is one one other question going back to the issue of of gdp and this comes from pilar vendrell at the in the government of catalonia um asks the question of whether you have applied or calculated for any country or bioregion the index you propose the environmental maturity index how is it calculated more information on on that the sort of uh you know is there is there a different 
form of index we can use to GDP, mentions green GDP, uh, as you'd mentioned, the gross national happiness index and, and others. I, I think we've covered this a bit, but particularly this issue of the environmental maturity index. What is that and how is how's that used? Yeah, that's, uh, my editor asked me, you know, what would you suggest, you know, propose something? So, well, you know, there are indigenous groups, for example, who have this extraordinary level of knowledge about their environment. They are, they are able to distinguish hundreds of species of plants and know what they can be used for, you know, depending on you know, this plant in combination with this other plant will help with toothache versus, you know, it, it's this extraordinary natural history knowledge that has been accumulated during many generations, which we have lost in, in, uh, in the global north. You know, we have lost most of it. So that was my idea, launch, um, just throwing out there an idea of how measuring how mature is our relationship with our nature that tells us a lot about uh, who we are and about our, our well-being. And you know, Pilar, no, I have not uh, calculated it for any country, but we could start with uh, my homeland, Catalonia. So I'll be happy to, to have a separate chat with you about that. Terrific. Well, let, let me say again, the, the book is The Nature of Nature. The author is Dr. Enric Sala. Uh, and just, you know, if I were to, to sum up for our international security focused audience here, I heard uh, several things that I hadn't even considered when I was reading the book. The, the first is we're not thinking big enough. We, we just can't address one problem at a time. The issue of pandemics comes from so many confluent issues, starting with the environment. Uh, the second is, uh, you know, now is, is, is the moment to, to, to start really thinking about this. As we, as we emerge from COVID, um, we need to broaden our aperture on the issues that, that we face. And uh, the, the final uh, challenge to, to all of us is that next year is going to be a big uh, opportunity when we have uh, the, the COP15 on biodiversity and uh, COP26 on uh, climate change. Those are both big issues, but they're also both connected. And we need to start seeing the connections between these things. We need to, when we pick up the newspaper and read about conflict over water, we need to think further downstream where the where those headwaters are. So that's the, the metaphor to go with. Uh, Dr. Sala, anything uh, you'd like to add uh, uh, about the book and uh, your your plans for, uh, for for getting this into the hands of, of policymakers all over the world. I, I noted that every time I go onto Amazon, it's a number one seller and a new category. Uh, the latest was sustainable business that I saw. We started out in conservation, I think, and have, have moved across all the categories. But uh, what, what are your plans to, to keep pushing this message? And my cat, obviously, is interested in the book as well. <laughs> uh, yes, uh I'm planning to reach many different audiences. Thank you so much, uh, Sam and CSIS, for giving me a chance to talk to your uh, security, uh, defense, uh, international stability community. Uh, I'm giving, I'm, I'm organizing events for for different communities and, and writing up heads and I've been on podcasts. But I, I have also sent copies of the book to heads of government and, and ministers. And I just got a, a very nice email from a minister of a, a very large and significant country saying thank you so much for sending the book that helped me make the connection between nature climate and the current crisis and i now get it so uh, that's my hope to be a little bit like a plumber to connect the pipes right to make sure that everything is connected and yes i'll i'll, I'll work with our campaign for nature with the WIS foundation to reach out to many more countries. So they agree to support this 30% uh, of the planet protected by 2030 so that both we and, and nature can thrive. Enrique, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And we'll hope to have you to CSIS uh, sometime soon and, and hope you'll be back out on, on your uh, expeditions uh, in the not so distant future as well. But, but we hope you Stay well and uh, thank you so much for, for all that you're doing to preserve nature for all of us. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you.